You talk a lot about how nimble you can be in your strategy in the dynamic bond fund. And we have been getting so many headlines on US-China trade, a lot of them taken positively by the market, whether that's right or wrong. So what strategies have you been employing or are you about to employ with the latest headlines? Thank you for having me here. Um, for the last actually three years, we've been very focused on trade war. We, you know, I, in all the internal investment strategy meeting, I said trade war is the number one downside risk to the global economy. So we have been well prepared for that. So in our strategy, we are long all the you know, countries like long duration in bond market, all the countries involved in trade war. So number one, the US, number two, China, number three, Mexico, and number four, Australia, New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And so we, that's one of the reasons, you know, we have been benefiting from this intensifying trade war. Okay, so your long duration, that makes sense if you think there's downside risks, but what are you doing at the front end if you're expecting the Fed to try and offset these trade war risks with cuts? Um, at the end of last year, you know, we, our research showing the Fed overreached by tightening too much. So we actually openly challenged the Fed language, say monetary policy was still accommodative after December rate hike. Our internal research showing the monetary policy is too tight. So with the two rate cuts this year, the monetary policy is back close to neutral. But I think as you know, the economy continues to weaken, inflation below target. I think the Fed will continue to call rate. Mm. So if your long duration, that suggests that you don't see a resolution to the US-China trade war anytime soon. But if, for example, by the end of the year, we come to some sort of truce, maybe even some of the tariffs are rolled back, which is what China has been asking all along. So it's always curious to me when we see a risk on jump just when there's a pause in tariffs. But nonetheless, if we do come to some sort of truce by the end of the year, would you be maybe changing some of those longs at all? or putting money in risk assets elsewhere in the fixed income space? So normally in our investment strategy, we mix the strategic allocation and the tactical. So last uh -huh. week, we caught the long duration in the US a little bit, you know, 10%. Right. But still the number one long you know, position. Uh, I, th I think a short term you know, suspension of the trade war may be pushing bond yield up by 20, 30 basis points. But I think the, you know, the uncertainties, you know, will continue to dampen investment decision and they continue to put downward pressure on global growth. Mm -hmm. And do you share that view, Anne Catherine, in terms of continued downward pressure on global growth and perhaps therefore it's sensible to be long duration? Yeah, I think there continues to be a tug of war on bond markets. So um, there are several factors uh, exerting downward pressure, including um, a slowdown in global growth and also geopolitical uncertainty, which will likely continue to, uh, continue to persist. Um, uh, and this is then, on the other hand, faced by quite ambitious valuations on markets. Um, so long story short, yes, I would uh, say that um, US Treasury yields, for example, will uh, trade rage bound for the time being, being supported by Fed easing, being supported by risk aversion. Mm. How would you position on emerging markets? Some people have said to me that if we get positive news on the trade war, this is the first place they'd want to put their money in terms of emerging market debt. So emerging market debt would benefit in a situation where we see some release and tension um, concerning the global trade picture uh, and this then coupled with continued Fed easing, um, this would be supportive for emerging markets. But uh, let's be clear that you have to be selective here. So there are some country specific risks that investors also have to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. And on emerging markets, Kevin, how are you positioned there? And actually, you know, we say, you know, don't you know, put emerging market, we say, you know, for investors, they should go from G7 to G20. G20 is much more global, and that is, you know, uh, of a catchphrase. Uh, so I think investors have to get used to as most of the G7 country bond yield negative, you know, 17 trillion bonds trade negative yield. Uh, I've been telling investors, you know, lack of yield in developed countries, you know, particularly in Germany, Switzerland, it doesn't mean lack of opportunities. You know, we just need to be more flexible thinking out of a traditional box. Yeah, you know what, I'm so glad you brought up negative yields. Let me get back to that in a sec. Sorry to break the conversation, guys, but we've just got more headlines coming through uh, on Brexit. So an EU official uh, saying that the EU27 are to weigh a Brexit delay if there's no deal Thursday. I mean, this is something that we have been sort of starting to think about of whether it's inevitable that we do get um, some sort of extension. Uh, but this is here they're talking about an Brexit delay if there's no deal on 
Thursday. And also we're hearing that EU leaders plan to discuss Brexit at 3 p.m. today. We'll bring you more of those lines as we get them. In the meantime, Kevin, let me just come back to you uh, on negative yields because um, I was talking earlier this morning um, about a strategist from JP Morgan refusing to buy what he calls insane negative yielding bonds. And interestingly, uh, even though he does see a recession in Europe and a significant slowdown in the US, he says, look, negative yielding, this isn't fixed income investing. This is fixed loss investing. And I'm talking about uh, William Eigen, who's a JP Morgan veteran. I'm guessing you have a totally different view. So tell me how you take opportunities in the negative yielding world. Uh, we take it slightly different. So, you know, it depends on your reference. If your deposit rate, for example, in Switzerland, you know, where UBS Bank, uh, is minus 80, so minus 50 could be attractive. So the, the strategy we have actually is, you know, we systematically now short the four countries where 10-year government bonds trading very negatively, but long the countries, we think there's a substantial opportunity, yield can come down. So rather than just, you know, say we don't like negative yield, stay cash, you actually more penalize on cash. You loan the countries, we think monetary policy is too tight, and the central bank more like the cut rate. So we, you know, we loan US, China, Mexico, New Zealand, you know, but we also show the Germany, Switzerland, Sweden, and Japan. So that's overemphasized. It wasn't just short, and you, um, you also got negatively penalized. Yes. Um, do you see any time soon that we could move out of this negative yielding environment and capture and given the direction of global central banks? And not any time soon, I'm afraid. Um, so central banks have shifted into more uh, into easing mode. Um, so this it doesn't um, give uh, any clue towards uh, a negative yield environment uh, okay. ending. Yeah. Um, just finally, Kevin, uh, as we keep getting these headlines through on Brexit, what positions are you taking based on what might come out here um, from the Brexit negotiations? Uh, for the moment, we are neutral on the currency, uh, but a short the 10-year gills. So actually, since the Brexit decision, we have been locked on, on the right side every time. You know, we traded sterling quite tactically. We were short sterling against Japanese yen. I just took a profit last week as the prospect for a deal. Uh, increasing. Yeah. So I think the prospect for deer is the best since November last year. But still, we don't, I don't know what's the probability of uh, a done deer.